welcome to another military history Q&A, the only YouTube channel who is guaranteed to be fueled on ice cream and have built a fitness studio in his living room, guaranteeing that I will be single for the rest of my life. Never mind. This episode, we are going to talk about German bunkers, the German fortified lines to the east to the west, why they were there. I have some original footage. I have a little bit of walkthroughs. And there's a lot of information because you have asked me a lot of questions about the uh, German bunkers. So this is going to be a very detailed, extensive episode dedicated to German fortifications and German bunkers with a lot of video inserts, the pictures I could find that were relevant, and I go into some detail as to who built them and how a German bunker has built back then. You may want to put on a pot of coffee because there's going to be a lot of information coming at you that I have specifically uh, researched and cross-referenced on this one. We're talking about bunkers, uh, fortified positions, which are strengthened positions that are making it harder for bombs of today, arrows of yesteryear to, to penetrate your, your position. You had medieval castles, you had the Vikings built up huge earth embankments with uh, poles to repel and fight from. The Germans and Americans, British, all of us, everybody has built bunkers, strengthened positions uh, to shelter for various reasons. Uh, for instance, you look during World War One, World War Two, on the coasts of America, the coast of England, there was bunker positions, cannon positions, uh, fighting dugouts uh, put along the coast to guard from Japanese invasions, German invasions, um, as especially in, in England you saw as well. And uh, one thing that was pretty much even for all, that the coasts and the beaches were off limits, as everybody was busy planting landmines and building all the way up in today. If you go to Albania, you have millions of bunkers protecting against pretty much everybody back in the day. Um, yes, I will go at some point in time. I am a little bit curious. It is fascinating to go through history, wherever you go. World War II still sits around every corner. Here, an old German bunker shooting port still there, the Iron Gates. It is fascinating to wander through the European landscape and see the remnants of World War II because they're everywhere. German bunkers here, you go east, you see Russian fortifications, you see fighting positions from everywhere in the landscape that has now been incorporated in everyday life because seriously they're too big too heavy they're built too well to destroy so people build summer houses on top of them and for a lot of lucky owners around the world they have a wine cellar that will last for the next hundred years before world war ii really broke out you already had fortified positions that was left behind from world war one the french took the lessons from World War I that digging in fortified positions that could be protected with relatively few B echelon troops would be an idea. So they built the Maginot Line, a huge fortified long, long position. And the Germans built their Siegfried Line across from there, which was not quite as complete and certainly not nearly as elaborate, but that was one of the German fortified lines towards the west that they started building before World War II actually broke out. It was, it evolved throughout the war, but it never became what it had been envisioned. The most interesting uh, fortified line the Germans had that you don't know about is probably the one facing east. The Ostwall towards East Poland was started in 1934 in order to guard against a Polish attack and it gradually increased and evolved, as we will see, to one of the most interesting and intricate uh, fortified lines that was built during World War II or for World War II. It almost uh, rivaled the Maginot Line. Unfortunately, when the, finally the Russians came and they needed it, they just didn't have the manpower or the weaponry to actually put it into uh, the full use they had expected. And of course, as we all know, we had the Atlantic Wall from the border of Spain all the way up to the tip of Norway, guarding all of occupied Europe against an allied invasion. 
that's one of the main fortified lines that we all know and have heard of and we've all seen those bunkers and for those of us who spent time in Europe or, or grew up there there's bunkers everywhere and they were all built to uh, standard spec and we're going to talk a lot about those you also build civilian air raid shelters because of course as we entered uh, the 20th century and civilian uh, bombing became a thing civilian bunkers sprung up everywhere air raid shelters and you still see them in uh, most European cities uh, you also had to build fortified bunkers and positions to protect your underground or key uh, infrastructures so like producing ammunition, weapons storage of strategic oil reserves a lot of it was burrowed into the ground and protected there but where that wasn't possible you had to build large fortified uh, like the u-boat pens in France amazing or the huge bunker for Hitler's train above ground um, you build bunkers for a lot of different reasons but we're going to look at the fighting positions and that's what we're going to talk about today so I want to start talking about the East Wall or the Ostwald first because I just think it's the most interesting because it's the one most of us really don't know a whole lot about. Uh, can some of this construction started all the way back in the late 20s uh, to guard the Germany from attacks from the Second Polish Republic. And I am actually going out there in a few weeks here in July. So Peter, Andrea, I'm I'm coming to see you and we're going to eat some good Polish food and we will wear our shoes because I want to see everything and I will bring it to you and I'm really looking forward to that. It was referred to as Festung Front Oden Warburg Borgen. It consisted of three different defensive lines. Um, this one that I have butchered the name, I'm sure. Uh, sorry. It was the fortified military defense line uh, from Nazi Germany back in the day between the Oder and Warta rivers. They used the river's waterways as a part of the defense and as a part of excuse to build and have construction in that area back in the early 30s uh, even before uh, Hitler took power they were working on this defensive line which makes it interesting it was very much inspired by the Maginot line and uh, we'll see it is it is almost as elaborate parts have been referred to as Camp Earthworm denoting that there was a lot of underground tunnels uh, that was dug in and built in this thing. Predominantly built between 1934 and 44, it was the most technologically advanced uh, bunker system uh, that the Germans built. And we're looking at over 100 defensive structures, 32 kilometers of underground railroads. Uh, this was an amazing thing. And most of the structures was partially interconnected and interlock in fields of fire. Let's get one thing straight. When I say bunkers and defensive positions for the rest of this episode, the surrounding minefields and barbed wire is just going to be mandatory. So if I say bunker, just picture in your mind without me saying so, it'll be surrounded by barbed wire, there'll be landmines and other obstacles, tank obstacles, beach obstacles if it's on the beach, surrounding it. So, disclaimer, done. They'll be everywhere. Tons of barbed wire and tons of landmines. There's some really interesting main fortifications along this line, but the system of tunnels run 32 kilometers and 40 meters deep underground. Besides that, you had access to railway stations. It has their own underground system, uh, workshops, engine rooms, infirmaries, barracks, housing. Uh, There's everything you'd need was underground. Initially, before Hitler took power, the first stage uh, of, of this part of the fortification had begun, which was initially a lot of water obstacles where you could flood areas or lift bridges, thus funneling the enemy into uh, positions of, of fields of fire and landmines and whatever else you had. Uh, initially, that was pretty much what it was with 12 light bunkers. It is said that after they've been building till 35, Hitler visited and he was not entirely impressed. Now, you must look at this in the context of the then German doctrine of war, which was the complete opposite of the French and was all about movement. The German commanders had no intention of digging in in the next war like they did in World War I and sit and shell each other. They were going to move, move rapidly, get 
but you have all about the panzer spearheads uh, overrun the enemy keep exploiting breakthroughs and not digging in so the idea that they were actually building fortified positions to guard against attacks was a little bit at odds with the uh, pre predominant doctrine of the time but still they of course built to hold enemies back uh, on the on the west and in the east you also had bunker fortifications facing like Czechoslovakia and all of this east wall uh, was not scheduled to be finished until 1951 but of course uh, war broke out in 1939 and the Germans advanced way past this fortified line way into the east so all work uh, ceased on uh, on this fortification after night about 1938 uh, until 1944 when the war in the east was moving closer to Germany and they tried to rapidly expand and refortify this position. When the Russians finally got to it in 1945, around January, in their main offensive, Germany was very short of resources, weapons, soldiers, so the line was held and filled by uh, reservists, Volkssturm, uh, Hitler Youth, not the top-notch troops that it had been envisioned and the weaponry was many times missing uh, the cannons and machine guns they were told they would find in the bunkers were just missing there was not one there uh, they still managed to hold the Russians at bay for three days uh, given how little they actually had at that time that was rather impressive underground factories had moved into this uh, area and all of this was of course taken by the Russians after the war ended but all the bunkers are still there to see today it's an amazing museum most pens of of the central section were large rectangular shaped type B about one and a half meters uh, wall thickness concrete bunkers they're all designed to be self-sufficient closed combat quarters the pens of the house the, the crew the quarters is uh, sanitation amenities machine rooms ammunition storage all of this was all self-contained if it was there which in 1945 some of it had uh, been taken away to more active fronts and it was missing it didn't show up before the russians did you also get the machine gun steel turrets armored observation cupolas five centimeter mortar positions you even had flamethrowers set up in this position so it was designed to defend just like the maginot line uh, had it been fully staffed, equipped, and fitted up, it would have been interesting to see how long it would have taken for the Russians to break through. But as we know, all defensive positions can be broken. Another part was the Pomeranian Wall. It was constructed in two phases from 1930 to 35 as a light defensive position in case of attack from, the, like I said, the Second Polish Republic. And then there was a line of fortifi fortification stretching from Landsberg to Amdervade, Kratzowilipolski to Baldenburg. I am sorry to my friends in Poland. I Teach me your language and I will not butcher it online. There are some really impressive strong points on this one, the uh, Deutsche Kronen and the Hangman's Mount. Second phase of this construction really did not start until 1944, but then it uh, didn't quite make it um, in time for the Russians to show up and knock on the door. Then you had a southern part of the position near the Nice River. The Oder position was a fortified line near the river, Oder in Silesia, and East Brandenburg consisted of about 650 reinforced concrete bunkers. They were supposed to have been 780, but they didn't get that far. The southern extension of the Oder Waden Fortress Arms again started in 1928 and continued all the way up until 1939 when when they stopped, when there was no need for it until well, back to 1944. Hundreds of, of wooden say, shelters, uh, earth shelters, concrete machine gun positions, trenches, armored trenches, reinforced artillery positions, all the usual fun stuff, like I said. But this is a whole bunker complex structure that was facing the east. It's in Poland now, for the most part, since the borders moved after World War II and there's an amazing museum there's some great guys that i am talking to and looking forward to visit and walk through all these uh, uh, underground tunnels but just imagine 40 meters down 32 kilometers of uh, 
tunnels. That is an amazing amount. If you look at just one stretch of this, 650 bunkers, this is an enormous fortified line that most of you may not have heard of and some of you have not had a chance to visit. And I will give you a full breakdown reporting of their including the best restaurants I find in the neighborhood. The West Wall, the secret line, was built opposite the French Maginot Line, or at least to counter it. But it was not initially nearly as elaborate. We're still looking at the start of building in the 1930s, and it stretched more than 630 kilometers, all the way from Cleve, border of the Netherlands, along the western border of the old German Empire to the town of uh, Wiel am Rhein on the border of Switzerland. So all the way on Germany's western border. It had more than 18,000 bunkers and tunnels and tank traps, a lot of dragon's teeth. Initially in the early 30s, it was only small bunkers, 50 centimeter thick uh, wood wall embrasures, um, facing front sleeping accommodations were hammocks. Um, exposed positions, wooden roofs, small bunkers were erected here and there uh, with a, you know, armored turrets, uh, lookout roofs. It was carried out by the Border Watch, or the Grenzwatch, um, which was a fairly small militarized troop that was activated in Rhineland right after the region was remilitarized after the demilitarization. But it was not at all what it eventually became, or certainly not what it was envisioned as uh, was supposed to have been. In 1938, the Liems program was ordered by Hitler in order to strengthen the fortifications facing uh, France. Was the cover story for the program was that it was an uh, uh, archaeological study. It's a very long archaeological dig, 630 kilometers. Anyway, everything has a cover story. A lot of Type 10 bunkers, far more uh, strongly con uh, constructed than their earlier ones, at a meter and a half, it was about four feet, some thick ceilings, walls, about 3,400 of these were built along the entire length of the Siegfried Line. It features central rooms or shelters, and you had elevated sections with embrasures with front and sides for machine guns, more embraces were provided for riflemen. The entire structure was constructed uh, as to be safe against poison gas. Although everybody had signed on to not using poisonous gas, you never knew. There was also heating installed because there were some cold winters that I actually wrote about. They, they were still fairly tight. You're looking about one square meter, about 11 square feet per soldier that was allocated in the living quarters. Um, but he got a place to sleep and he had a chair. What more could you possibly ask for in the infantry, even today? Then you had the Arkansas program bunkers were pretty similar to the ones that had been designed for the Liam's program. Uh, type 107, double MG casemates, uh, concrete walls, all the way up to three and a half meters thick. That's about 11 feet. So now we're getting into serious bunker territory here. The differences was that there was no embrasures at the front, only on the sides of the bunkers. Embrasures only built at the front in special cases and were protected with heavy metal doors. The construction phase included the towns of Aachen and Saarbrücke, which were initially west of the Liams program defensive line. You also had the Western Air Defense Zone, which was lines paralleling the defensive lines where you had anti-aircraft, uh, MG-42, 34 and 42, and flak cannon positions and uh, flak bunkers set up to guard against Allied aircraft that would have to cross the line in order to get in over Germany. On the Siegfried Line, all the construction was done by the tour organization that had almost 500,000 uh, laborers, private firms, at its disposal to work on, on this. And it was dangerous work. It was large, heavy, 60-ton armored plates uh, to be moved. It was cold, it was wet, and uh, certainly accidents happened. Uh, a lot of the workers for the tort organization uh, were volunteers, as you see with the, with the construction of the German Autobahn, of the freeways back in the day. Uh, there was also forced laborers, and we'll talk more about that, but one thing, when we say forced laborers, there's a distinct difference between 
between them and between forced laborers and slave labor and POWs that have been put to work, a lot of the forced laborers were forced in the sense that, well, uh, German worker, you have no other job that is important to the war industry, so now you have a job and you're going to go build bunkers. In that sense, they were forced to work on something else that was more important to the war effort or the pending war effort or the defense of the country than whatever they were doing. So if you thought you were selling, uh, if you're a big strong man and you were selling newspapers on the corner, uh, no, you would be reconstructed into the labor service. Uh, everybody who worked on the West Wall construction, they even got a medal for it, they got paid, they had meals, and yes, they were still miserable. During the construction of the secret line, the German industry had a hard time delivering all the steel that was needed for what was intended. Uh, although Germany had strategically built railways ever since World War I, and these were utilized very, very well for the construction and movement of construction materials throughout Germany and later throughout Europe. Uh, initial as it is with tanks, early war tanks, they were under-armored and undergunned. The initial bunkers that was built in the, in the mid to late 30s were initially, as it turned out as the war begun, undergunned and some of the guns and steel plates were removed and, and moved over to the construction of the Atlantic Wall that was so much more important at least until just around July 1944 when D-Day had apparently succeeded. Priority was put back on construction of the Siegfried Line and a lot of Tobruks were put up, a lot of dragon's teeth and so on and so forth all of which at the time of the Allies getting there really did not prove very helpful. And as we see with the initial construction phases that had led up to 1939, after the invasion of Poland, the French army actually made a little foray into Germany. Uh, they in, advanced some, some 10, 15 kilometers, more on that in a later episode when I go there. It was not supported, it was not backed up, it was certainly not halted by the, at that time, secret line. With the German soldiers, they were in the open with machine guns, a few mortars, a few cannons, and they saw French tanks roll up uh, towards them. They didn't want to open fire because they were afraid that then they'll probably get fired upon exponentially and not survive. So uh, the secret line initially were not really worth a whole lot. Um, certainly not what it eventually turned into or should have been. One of the things that was the French doctrine and when it came to bunkers, fortifications, the German as well as most countries were that your battle-hardened tough frontline troops would be out fighting a battle while the B echelon, the ones who were recovering from wounds, the little younger, the little older, could man these fortified positions with fewer people, less well trained, uh, less capable because they had a very limited duty. You sit here, you look out this embrasure with your machine gun and you shoot anything that's not wearing our uniform. That's pretty damn simple. Uh, of course it also gives some morale issues and especially if you look at the Western Wall or the Atlantic Wall rather, if you look at the Atlantic Wall and the people who fortified and occupied it. Yes, you had hundreds of thousands of German troops, which was a lot fewer than it would have taken to defend the same stretch of territory without all these positions. However, they were not the best troops, and they were augmented by uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and I have actually found a few Polish. When I say volunteers, let me break that down. If you are a Russian, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, whatever soldier and you're sitting in a German prison of war camp that can barely feed you and you are looking at the possibility of sitting outdoors starving to death in the next winter and the option of well volunteering for the German army comes along in the sense of self-preservation and exactly what you do so there was a lot of Eastern European volunteers that was defending uh, in, in, in Normandy, in France, in, in these positions, um, which of course did not give it the same fighting capability as it had been uh, manned by 
well-trained, motivated uh, German troops all along the line, but these were in shorter and shorter supply and needed to starve off the Russians from the east. But that was the same thing with the Maginot Line. The French put their B echelon troops throughout the Maginot Line and honestly they did a very good job. We always thought the French were overrun in a matter of uh, with ease. Uh, the French problems during the invasion of France in World War II was not really the Maginot Line. It was built to make the Germans attack somewhere else which they did, so it was successful, and in, in the first day of attack on there, four out of the six uh, invasion, the German invasion points were halted by the French defenders. So it, in theory, uh, could work, and that's pretty much what the Germans did. They sat down on the coasts, and of course, the Atlantic Wall, that we have all heard so much about and seen in the movies, the Atlantic Wall was probably the largest building construction project of the 20th century. It came about after, of course, Germany had uh, invaded France, Denmark, Norway, and was in a two-front war against the Soviet Union, but always expecting an Allied landing to liberate Europe from the West. It was initially called the West Wall, uh, but since it already had a west wall, it was renamed to the Atlantic Wall. It was stretched all the way from the uh, borders of Spain all the way up to the far side of Norway, covering Denmark, the Netherlands, Holland, Belgium, France, uh, Norway, where you still today see all these amazing structures. As we go through the landscape of Europe today, everywhere there are signs of a war that never really touched the American shores. We were never really bombed as it happened here in Europe. And I will say that they are amazing structures. Uh, they were built in the most far-flung places, places that are imp impossible to construct in today. And uh, they really are fascinating to see. Uh, some people like to go see pyramids, I like to go see bunkers because I am impressed with what people could imagine and do and see these interlocking and underground and disguised in many cases bunkers. No matter where you go in Europe today, you find remnants like this old German bunker fortification from the coast of Denmark all the way down the coast of France. Men and women fought and died here 75 years ago. And their memories are disappearing along with them. It all started uh, on the West Wall with somewhere around 1942 where in the occupied territories, uh, France, Belgium, Holland, all civilian construction was halted because all cement and resources were to be used in order to build uh, these bunkers and this. It was put under the auspices of uh, the Tod organization, Fritz Tod, who uh, was pretty much in charge of the German uh, logistics for the building program. He was killed in an air crash and Albert Speer took over. Evan Rommel was in the final year of the war put in charge of the Atlantic Wall. and His philosophy was to stop the enemy on the beach or at sea and not let them allow them a beachhead. Of course, Evan Rommel fought the British and Americans in Egypt in the in the desert and he knew what Allied air power could do. Some of the slightly older generals uh, were not hearing his point of view and there was a large debate within the German high command in France between uh, Rommel and Rundstedt to begin with on where and how to prepare uh, for this defense. But one thing was certain, they were going to build a lot of fortifications and a lot of bunkers facing the sea. So you had huge cannon emplacements all the way down to um, machine gun positions, the small two-person to brook bunkers that you see everywhere. On the street and roadways, you even have armored uh, single guard posts. Uh, which is rather interesting to see, both in metal and uh, some in concrete. Steel sentry cage. You had dragon's teeth all over the beaches, 
and your command posters, observation posts, radar positions, flak positions, uh, man, uh, man positions where the, the crews of the cannons would be stationed. You have interlocking running trenches. You have uh, positions all interlocking fields of fire so they're mutually supportive. Uh, lots of underground uh, connecting tunnels where possible and some enormous uh, cannon positions and command positions. They even built a rocket production facility that was never quite completed because towards the end of the war it was severely damaged by Allied bombing um, and by the time that they could have recovered from that it had been taken over uh, by Allied ground forces. Uh, but in am amazing constructions also you had the U-boat pens specifically around the port cities they were built uh, cannon positions, defensive positions to defend against uh, an, an obvious invasion attempt on the ports because of course that time invasion and military is all about logistics so if the allies could run straight into a port facility and take it intact they could have their ships come in and un unload uh, supplies and advance from there. So the ports were especially well defended and you still today see some of these enormous bunkers that you literally cannot destroy. So you had these, uh, these fortifications all the way through and of course the inhabitants of these areas uh, were moved out or relocated. Every, every one of the fighting powers closed off their beaches and in some cases relocated the population away from what could potentially become a fighting zone. So nothing specific uh, about the Germans to that. Uh, we did it, the British did it, everybody did it. Uh, you have to get civilians out of the way and if that means they have to move their house because you need to put a, a cannon position or a bunker there, well, too bad. Originally more than 15,000 bunkers had been planned, but of course Germany was at war two fronts building other places only 6,000 were actually constructed by the deadline of May 1, 1943. Uh, of these 510 were in Holland alone where they were supposed to have been 2,000. The Germans would take over uh, whatever pre-existing fortifications there already were. Uh, some of the Dutch fortifications were taken over and expanded by the Germans. And what is interesting about how this all came about. Remembering the German doctrine was that of movement, not digging in and fortifying. When the German troops went to a place, when they got to Denmark, when they got to the French coast, when they got to Belgium or Holland, they knew exactly where they were going to build their bunkers and position the defensive positions and where they were going to dig in. Because before the war, before the invasion, German tourists or soldiers in uh, civilian had done bicycle rides and painters and took artistic pictures all the way up and down the coasts posing as tourists made maps and maps and notes on where they would have to build these fortifications before they, they even invaded that country. So the Germans had a very clear and specific plan on how and what and where they were going to build and what made this easier was they had over a hundred different type of standard designed bunkers. They wouldn't just slab up whatever. They were uniform. They knew exactly how much concrete, how much wood, how much reinforced, uh, how much rebar, uh, steel doors. They knew exactly how m much and what materials they needed for any given type of bunker. So when they go to, went to a place, said, well, we need a couple of Regelbau, a regular build, standard. Uh, we need a couple of Tobruks, we need a couple of these, a couple of these. They knew exactly how much concrete they would need, how much refor rebar, they knew exactly how much labor it would take and how long it would take to build. And that is uh, kind of the brilliance of how and why the Germans, with relatively few resources, especially at the tail end of the war, when they were really stretched, were still able to build and expand continuously because they knew exactly what to allocate. If you look at the uh, Danish, uh, the German forts in Denmark uh, that I documented, we ask, well, are the position, when was this position finished? None of the, the, the Atlantic Wall was never complete. None of the bunker uh, 
fort forts or fortifications or fighting positions were ever complete in that sense that uh, if the war had lasted 10 more years, they wouldn't build any more on there. What they did was each region, each commander, each section would be allocated X amount of building material every year. And they would, of course, build what was priority list. First, they need to, we need to build housings for the big guns, for the cannons. We need to build machine gun bunkers. Uh, so that was what they would build in the first allocation of the first year of that occupation. Then the second year, well, then they would build reinforced housing for the troops, the trains, uh, and so on and so forth. So every year would be a progressive build because it was always an ongoing and evolving uh, construction. If you look at the Siegfried line, problem was initially the small bunkers they had built with the relatively small cannons. When those uh, had proven insufficient, well, all these cannons were pulled out and put to other use in the 39 and the 40s. Some of the steel doors were eventually repurposed and sent to the Atlantic Wall. But now there's a problem because you had to finish bunkers, but you couldn't put bigger cannons in there. So, because they're already, uh, they're already finished constructing, there was not enough room, sort of like why you couldn't put a 76 millimeter in a Panzer one turret. There's just not enough room. And they have to build more bunkers that are bigger. But the basic construction outline of how you went about doing this is not really much different than from today. First, you dig a hole. Then you build in a reinforced steel frame and you surround it by wooden framework. Then you pour in a whole bunch of concrete and you let that dry for 24x hours so then you mount the steel doors, all the ventilators, the heaters, uh, sleeping beds, embrasures, whatever you need after that. And of course, depending on how large a bunker it is, you've seen some of these enormous structures. You can't pour all that concrete in one day. And you need to get all these thousands and thousands of tons of cubic meters of concrete to the site. Uh, which is, again, why it takes time to build some of these enormous structures and why it is very impressive to see some of these huge bunkers because of the logistics it took. We're still trying to figure out how they, they built the pyramids logistically. Uh, here is, is something that's almost akin to that. When you look at the very, very, very large structures, uh, it was a rather impressive uh, engineering feat, to be quite honest especially when you look at underground facilities of hundreds of rooms uh, 40 meters down. That's impressive. Now, of course, this was not an easy time when the Germans moved in and started redesignating areas as defensive positions for the, for the civilians. A lot of them had to be moved. So when Germans designated an era off, off limit or Sperrgebiet, then it was again up to the local authorities of that region, of that country, to inform those who unfortunately had to leave their house and home and go somewhere else. It wasn't Germans with rifles driving you from your home at gunpoint. It was done within the local authorities, so people had time to pack up and go, and many of them would not return. Some of their houses had been torn down, uh, monuments, statues had been torn down, uh, forests had been cleared to, for fields of fire and construction of these defensive works. But again, pretty much all countries uh, did this. Uh, if, you, if you're in the way of, of, of a national threat, you, your, your house will have to relocate. Um, and that is pretty much exactly what, what happens. So practically how this worked, uh, it was the German military engineers that was in charge of what kind of uh, fortifications they needed to build, where they wanted to put up, and it was the organization Tod that was responsible for building them. That was the practicality of it. If you had something like, for instance, in Denmark, it was uh, Festung Pioneerstab 31 that was in charge of planning and designing the constructions, whereas it was the local branch of OT, Organization Tod that was hired to build it. 
and they in turn hired local contractors to do the practical work of building it. Interestingly enough, there were actually a lot of volunteers, Danish volunteers, French and so on volunteers, uh, that signed up to build these things because it was the only work there was to get at the time. Now it is interesting, again I mentioned the German doctrine of war was about movement and getting out there and moving forward and mechanization to a degree. Of course, the German bunker construction was somewhat inspired by the Maginot Line. However, Hitler was very adamant that this was going to be a position where the troops could find shelter from uh, air raids and artillery, but not a position where they would be complacent and want to just hide and not fight. So the German High Command were looking for something a little more flexible, something that could be uh, protection, but not in, in the underground comfortable way. It would still be, uh, be a fighting position meant and thought of as a temporary stopover before further movement. Back to the logistics. When you build a Regelbau bunker and wind the construction on the way, initially a meeting would be held between the military branch that ordered the construction, like the army, and the OT. This meeting, a building site, would be discussed, taken into consideration the pros and cons, and there were considerations made to existing private property and history, uh, terrain, and as these plans were made. So they did not, if they could avoid it at all, roll over historical monuments, history, or, or the local farmhouse. And I think there's an interesting note. Where this could not be avoided, uh, farmers got to go. You had most of the common bunkers in the Atlantic Wall was called uh, the B strength, Baustake B, uh, which were about two meters thick reinforced concrete walls, roof, were capable of withstanding about a direct hit from about a 500 kilogram airborne bomb or about 200 millimeter artillery shell straight on. But these things were built to, to withstand bombs and yeah. shells and... Yeah. The walls are three meters thick and also the roof it's um, it's thicker than normal. The normal size of uh, a World War II bunker is two meters, but here on uh, in Belbring, it's uh, three meters because they couldn't get it underground. The the soil is too moist, so they built them on the ground. All personnel and operational bunkers had their own heating and ventilation system. They had telephones, radio communication, and they were gas proof. Uh, with the entrances were all covered by machine gun embracers. The bunkers were definitely uniform. They had a plan and they carried it out and they, they did not deviate. Although some places where they partially built into um, mountains, which is Norway and um, parts of France, where you had to improvise a little bit and they tunneled into these existing mountains and built smaller bunkers around the entrances or where the, the weaponry would stick out fascinating excavations that I've seen. I know History Hunter has been digging through a lot of those here on YouTube. You should check out his videos. He did a great job on that. Building an R622 bunker, which is one of the predominant crew protection bunkers that you see around the Atlantic Wall. First, of course, you can do the paperwork because German army and military does not run without their paperwork. First, you had to remove sand, soil, um, whatever was in the way of a building as a crew bunker and it had to be built so it would blend in with the landscape and it would be able to be camouflaged uh, later on and not be able to be seen which is why a lot of these are still actually hidden and easy to hide because they even put on grass on top of them so they were really hard to see from the air. You would move for this type of bunker, the R622, about five, six hundred cubic meters of uh, material was removed and this had to be done by hand shovels, wheelbarrows, hard labor, digging in the ground. Uh, there were excavators used if these were available, which were certainly by all means not everywhere. Uh, the work days, typical 10-14 hours, seven days a week, um, a little extra sleep on Sunday for the workers. Some of these bunkers were also built right on the ground, not dug into it, depending on it was rocky, hard, or the high groundwater. 
so that's why you see some of these just sitting on the on the ground uh, the steel reinforcement was 25 by 25 centimeter mesh about 12, 12 millimeter round steel bar rebar shape tied together with wire the reinforced mesh it would reinforce brittle concrete and make it far more resistant of uh, impact so it wouldn't shatter and it was not always the best concrete you had to use especially later on the war as materials became more and more scarce. I-profile steel bars connected with 20 centimeter wide 2-3 millimeter steel thick plates was formed on the ceiling. Uh, before casting drain pipes, uh, conduits for electrical installations, air conduits, radio antenna, chimneys would be fitted. Uh, chimneys would be fitted with a deflector for hand grenades and dem or demolition charges so you can just throw like you see in some of the movies you can just throw in a hand grenade because it will literally slide out and not actually enter the uh, the bunker. A lot of the bunkers they had a periscope fitted which is a high ticket item if you find one. I have a lot of friends in museums that really really would like to get a periscope because they're just so hard to find. So if you have a original World War II German bunker periscope sitting in your basement it is important to pour the entire bunker in one go. Pausing and restarting would or could weaken as a result. And the pouring of concrete literally had to go on around the clock or for days on end and if it was a, a large bunker. Um, the approach for the bunkers had to be good. This approach kind of worked and it was possible to keep pouring and keep maintaining for bunkers up to about 1,000 uh, cubic meters of concrete. Larger constructions had to be done in sections like I mentioned before because concrete, heat, hardening, all these aspects there are to building something like this. Um, it was important that the concrete didn't uh, get time to settle and didn't split and I'm not an engineer but I know that much. Plus in order to to facilitate that you can continuously pour concrete until the small bunker was done you had to have the scaffolding uh, ready and in place so you could always continue pouring that did not have um, all the, the the ways of doing that that we have uh, today and the Germans used a high quality mixture of, of sand gravel three four hundred kilograms of cement per metric ton of concrete and imported aggregates as well uh, for instance, the local gravel in Jutland and Denmark tend to be too round uh, or contain too much flint in order to, uh, to really work well in, in, uh, in bunkers. So you can't just pour whatever into it. You'll see some bunkers, they display like patterns, little, little holes in them that kind of could be interpreted as, as air pockets that developed uh, during the pouring or ladder damage, uh, erosion of the surface. Actually, what they are is part of the camouflage that was, uh, it was achieved by nailing crumpled cement paper bags uh, onto the sides of the outer, outer shuttering. Just because if it was completely smooth, the surface would stick out um, from the background. It would be easier to detect. You also see that on the outside of the concrete, you had to pour uh, asphalt so that moisture could get into the cement. That's why if you see the original bunkers and you get them really, they're, they're black. Uh, and then, of course, camouflage would be applied to that as well. But you had a black layer of, of, of tar or asphalt on, on the outside of them. After the bunker was done, the military engineers would take over after the, the case, the shell was done. Um, then they would install the door frames, the embrasures, the stoves, all that stuff, and, of course, uh, the weaponry. But the German bunkers, they, they were, you know, it's impressive. You had, you had heat, you had air condition, you had air flowing. They would put uh, wood, uh, wood on the walls and ceilings to insulate them further, both for sound, because if you're in a command center and you're sitting in a naked concrete bunker, the sound reverberates and it's hard to hear radios and it's just really noisy. So they would line all the walls and ceilings with wood, uh, because rubber would have been ideal, but not really wasn't available, especially not towards the end of the war. The fitting, the outfitting of any given bunker with the steel doors and the weaponry and radios and heaters and, and electrics, all the stuff uh, that would make the bunker useful or ready to, to be functional 
that actually usually took longer than building the entire outer shell. So construction, camouflage, fitting, and then it was handed over to whoever ordered it, whether it was the German, the army, the marine, or... Here they have their communication, uh, wireless and also telephones with the wires, so you can couple up to, uh, ex ex for example, Germany or other bunkers here in Denmark. But here, uh, because of all the electronics uh, there was in this room, they had to have some um, uh, special Insulation? Yeah, or what you call it, uh, floor. Uh, it was made of uh, asphalt and uh, rubber because there was so uh, the static electricity was so heavy that the, the German soldiers uh, get headaches and stuff. And if you look at today's building standards and norms and all the labor laws, it would be almost impossible to build some of these things today like the R622 uh, crew bunker. In Denmark, a surveyor did a study that with today's, uh, in today's money, it would cost almost 400,000 euros to build one of these things, which roughly I guess like $480,000. Um, you're looking at a very quick turnaround, maybe three to five weeks from beginning to delivery of many of these medium-sized bunkers, and certainly the small two-man to brook machine gun positions would only take 11, 15 cubic meters of concrete. They were quick and fast and easy to build, and you saw them everywhere. Uh, also, you would see armored turrets that was built onto bunkers, uh, or armored domes that was put onto an underground bunker. You would see tanks without engines that had roll, been rolled into an embrasure where it was covered from straight on attack and they would fight from the regular turret. You see those tank turrets uh, that were built and put in positions all over the World War II map. Uh, the Russians did it, the French did it, we did it, the British did it, uh, which is interesting. You see the especially smaller turrets of obsolete tanks had been taken off and, and put on these uh, beach locations. The first tank of World War II the Germans had, the actual tank was a Panzer I. Very small two-man machine guns. This is the turret. See how small this actually is. And what they did, they became obsolete quite quickly in the, in the war. You need to upgrade to bigger tanks, better armor, bigger guns. Uh, that the Panzer I chassis and turret just couldn't cope with. So they took these off and they planted them in encasements here in Normandy all around the occupied territories where they needed to defend they buried down just the turrets Panzer 1, 2, 3's. It's easy to build a small Tobruk two-man bunker and then put the turret of a Panzer 1 or 2 on top of it. By that time uh, the Panzer 1 and 2 had been obsolete by some time, so you're sitting with turrets with machine guns in them or smaller cannons that you could stick on there, which would be perfectly uh, well designed against personnel, uh, landing crafts, invasion forces initially without heavy tanks. This is where the ammunition train would come in, so let's go have a look. So the Germans spent an enormous amount of resources building these bunkers. Uh, all over Europe and the question then arises was it worth it for them to do so with the resources they used to build an Atlantic wall that was breached practically in a day and I cover that extensively in a Q&A a couple of weeks ago months ago and I well I answer that at length but uh, I have found uh, an answer to be absolutely yes and absolutely no. I guess you're going to have to go to that episode to figure out what I mean by that. Ha! Huh. <laughs> and send me your questions. And I'm sure there's something I forgot to tell you, but that's what we have next week for.